it's not that people give bad advice. It's just that when people say like, it's meaningless. Usually when you, if you ask somebody for marriage advice, like (laughs) right before we got married, I was talking to a guy who'd been married like 60 years. And I, I remember this vividly. I was like, okay, well, what's the secret to be married 60 years? He's like, I don't know. I think you just have to find the right person. If it's not the right person, you're going to hate each other and you're going to get divorced. <laughs> so, okay, well, hopefully I picked the right person. So, Did you pick the right person? So far, so good. Okay, all right, good. Celebrate good times. Come on. Oh, my goodness. Episode 300. This is Sparta. I cannot believe that we have made it to 300 episodes. Welcome to Business with Purpose. I am your host, Molly Stillman, and this show is all about bringing you the stories behind the brands, the companies, and the small businesses that are changing the world. Each week on this show, I hope to inspire you that you, no matter what you do for a living, you can make an impact. Normally, each week I get to sit down with an incredible entrepreneur, business owner, community leader, activist, author, speaker, and I find out their story and and how they are using their vocational pursuits to change the world. But then on the 10s, we have solo episodes and today is a big deal. This is episode 300. And when I started this podcast in the summer of 2016, nearly six years ago, I absolutely would not have believed you that I would make it that long and uh, that I would be recording episode 300. Every single week for nearly six years, I have produced and published an episode with almost entirely different guests every single week. And okay, I'm not somebody who's normally like, I'm great. That's not, that's not me. So, so I hope you hear my heart on this, but that's really hard work. (laughs) And when people say, you know, what do you do for a living? And I say, I'm a podcaster and people say like, Oh, that's cool. And, uh, people don't realize the work that goes into this. And, uh, but before I, you know, kind of get into uh, today's episode and this celebration that I want today to be, and just you like you sitting back and relaxing and just feeling like you're hanging out with me and and we're, you know, chit-chatting, is I want to thank the people that helped to make this show possible because without them, I don't know that I would have made it to episode 300. Uh, The number one person that I have to thank is my husband, John. And for years, he was actually my producer. Uh, He is no longer involved in the day-to-day production of my show, but without his encouragement, his support, and his producing skills early on, I don't know that I would have made this as as far as I have made it, if that makes sense. And um, it is, you know, his other company, Third Wheel Media, that is my uh, production company. And I just would not be able to do this without that team there. And Grace, who is my editor, who I just Grace, I love you. And I'm so grateful for you, because you make me sound way better than I probably am. And the fact that you listen to my show and edit it every week in and week out and just how amazing you are and how there have been so many times where I've emailed you in a panic because I accidentally mispronounced a guest's name and I've had to like re-record it (laughs) and then have you fix it and post and all of the things. uh, And you're just like, yep, got it. And for some reason, like you just are so fast and you're so good at what you do. I mean, I, I, I truly don't know what I would do without you. So Grace, thank you so much. And uh, for Kelly Hinchcliffe, Kelly, thank you so much uh, for doing my show notes every single week. Uh, I would, that is a huge weight off of my plate every single week. And uh, I would not be able to do it without you. So thank you so much. And just for your encouragement, Kelly will often email me and be like, I really loved this week's episode. It's just, it's an encouragement that um, is really needed. And, uh, and that's it. It's the three of us. So, (laughs) and I uh, do every, I do all the other stuff. So all the other behind the scenes, the scheduling and the booking and the interviewing and the social media and all that stuff. But I truly, um, I would not be able to do it, uh, without my husband, without grace and without Kelly. So, um, I just want to give a shout out at the beginning to them because 300 episodes would not have happened without (laughs) the support of those people. So let me tell you how today's show is going to go. I have some listener submitted questions. 
I have a special guest on the show that uh, we sit down and have a conversation. Uh, it's <clears throat> my husband by popular demand. We go over the top 10 most popular episodes. Uh, we take a moment to honor a guest uh, from the past who uh, actually has passed away. Uh, we talk about some shows that have lasted more than 300 episodes. We laugh and we are just celebrating. So sit back, relax and enjoy today's episode. So I got a bunch of questions submitted that a lot of you wanted me to answer in the show. I've kind of sprinkled those throughout, but some of them uh, specifically were for John or for John and myself, but then some of you submitted questions for me. And so I'm going to take a couple moments to answer a couple of the questions that you submitted. The first question is from Natasha. And Natasha says, when I was first learning about ethical fashion and what it means at the ripe age of 29, I'm ashamed to say that that's how old I was. But now that I know better, I do better. I was telling my stepmom of its importance and how most garment workers aren't paid a living wage from fast fashion companies. I mentioned that I was going to stop shopping at those companies. And she said to me, but don't those people need jobs too? I was a bit flabbergasted and to this day don't have a one sentence response. So my question to you is, how would you answer that? Thank you so much for your guidance and love. So number one, Natasha, I'm so grateful for you. You have always been uh, such an encourager. And so I'm really, really thankful uh, for you and for this question. I think it's a really great question. So because I am not somebody who can ever give a one sentence response, I don't have a one sentence response. However, <laughs> this is how I have actually answered that question. And, you know, there's not a clear cut answer, but this is, you know, and some people might disagree with me, but this is how I answer it is. The reality is, is that money talks and money is an influencer. And so if we are continuing to give money or, or you know, we'd always talk about voting with our dollars. If we give our dollars to companies that we know exploit their workers in any you know area of their supply chain whether it's on the manufacturing side whether it's on the you know like the customer facing side whatever it is where wherever they are kind of in the ecosystem of that brand if we know that they are exploiting that and we are not taking our dollars away from those companies then they are not motivated in any way shape or form to change however we have seen like there is actual evidence to the fact that when consumers demand better from companies when they demand, uh, you know, ending forced labor in their supply chains or, you know, um, ensuring that uh, their worker, their gar their, you know, they're working with RAP certified factories or certified B Corporation factories or, you know, fair trade certified factories. When, when, when consumers demand that and more often than not, that happens with their dollars, then more companies are incentivized to make those positive changes. So it's the reality is, is that, the, you know, we have a long way to go. So uh, the whole answer to like, don't those people need, need jobs too? their jobs for the most part are not going anywhere. And we can also argue that many of those people, uh, they're not earning enough to, to even, you know, barely make ends meet. So it's not like this is a dignified, this is not dignified work. And so that's, Another piece of this puzzle is how do we encourage companies to provide dignified work? How do we encourage companies to do something that is meaningful for their employees, for their garment workers, or for the people that make their items? And so, uh, you know, the the whole notion of don't those people need jobs too is is essentially a moot point. However, the reality is, is that money talks. And when we continue to financially support a company that we know is doing things incorrectly, it does not incentivize them in any way, shape or form to change. Um, and so we have seen firsthand, you know, where you have Gap and J. Crew and Madewell launching fair trade certified denim lines. Uh, same with Target. Uh, Target partnering with International Justice Mission to eliminate uh, human trafficking and uh, labor trafficking in their supply chains. Those things are a direct result from consumers demanding better. So I hope I, I know that's not a one sentence response, but I hope that that empowers you to say, you know, no, they do those people need jobs? Absolutely. Do they need undignified backbreaking work that pays them nothing? No, that's that's not what they need. So 
anyway, uh, I hope that answers your question. All right. The next question is from Mary. And Mary said, Molly, have you ever not aired a conversation? Uh, which I thought is a really interesting question. And the answer to that is, uh, yes, I have. There are there's two answers to this. There's two episodes that have never aired. One of them uh, was on not on purpose and the other one was on purpose. So one episode, <laughs> um, actually, we lost the audio. This was way back in the beginning, like fall of 2016. I did an interview um, with a brand owner. I'm not going to say who it was. It's not anybody bad, but I have not ha had a chance to have her back on yet. Um, because I think I was so embarrassed that I lost the audio. This is really early on. I think I tried to do the interview over the phone. So the audio quality was not great. Our internet quality was not great. And in the end, the audio got completely corrupted and we lost the whole thing. And I was so embarrassed. And because I mean, it was somebody that I really like admired and looked up to. And so I did this whole interview with her. And uh, to this day, it's I mean, it never aired because the audio didn't work. And I've been kind of too embarrassed to reach back out to her. But I think I actually have a goal of trying to reach back out to her and, and have her on in the next year or so. Uh, but yes, the, so that one did not air. There is another conversation that I did have uh, that I did not air. And I chose to not air it for a few reasons. And I'm again, I, I, I don't mean to like vague book over here. Um, I, I will not say who it was. Um, but you know, I am somebody who I love having uh, pe all different types of people and perspectives on the show. Um, that is something that I not only welcome, I encourage, you know, just because I have somebody on the show doesn't mean that I necessarily 100% align with everything that they say or agree with. I, you know, I, my goal is to have conversations with all kinds of people. Um, however, I did have a guest that I interviewed, who I was having this person on under a kind of one pretense. And very quickly, the conversation veered to a place that I was not comfortable with um, in just some language that was used, the, the topic that was used that was uh, became not safe for work, and also promoted some things that I just did not feel in any way, shape or form comfortable promoting. Um, and so it just, you know, for the most part, I, you know, I've covered some pretty heavy, difficult topics on this show. And, but for the most part, I try to keep it, you know, is safe for all listeners. And if there ever is, you know, a little bit of language or a topic that is heavy, I try to give a little bit of a warning or, a you know, a, a disclaimer at the beginning. But this one was just, there was almost nothing salvageable from it. And so I, I thanked this person for their time and uh, never aired it again. So and then they never messaged me uh, asking when it was going to air. So I was kind of hoping. Um, but yeah, so I, I mean, whether or not you agree with that decision or not, I just I had to make a judgment call. And my judgment call was, I don't think this is one I can air. And I remember even uh, playing part of it for my husband and said, Am I wrong? And he said, Oh, no, yeah, you can't air that. So uh, I hope that, yeah, I, I, maybe that's the best way I can possibly answer this question. Carly asked, what is one of the coolest things you've been able to do because of this podcast? That is a great question. And I, I think a couple of the things I would say is just, I mean, one, I've had the opportunity to interview some of uh, just some of the most incredible people. I mean, that I just never otherwise would have ever had the opportunity to sit down and talk to, you know, from Kev on stage to Rachel Cruz to Christy Wright, to uh, Santiago, Jimmy Mayado to Jennifer Allwood to Devin and Morgan Klein from Burn Boot Camp to, uh, you know, uh, Ian Morgan Cron. Uh, I mean, I've just, I've been able to interview some really, really incredible people. And I am beyond thankful for that opportunity. I would say keynoting at the Fair Trade Federation conference back in 2019 was such a highlight because I was sharing a stage with Jessica Honiger of Noonday Collection, with Liz Bohannon of Seiko Designs, with Lene Ferretti of, uh, you know, 10,000 Villages. I mean, I just people who are you know, people I really look up to. And the fact that I was sharing a stage with them was really incredible. Also in 2017, when I got to design a line of clothing for Elegantees, that was amazing. My friend Carly and I actually, it's funny, Carly, uh, a Carly asked this question, but my friend Carly and I 
got to design that line together and that was incredible. Um, I also got to de design a line of bags with Malia designs. It's just, you know, I would never have been able to do that had I not uh, had this podcast. And so for that, I am forever, forever grateful. So Sarah Ann submitted this next question and she said, what is your favorite Australian food? And I just want to give a quick shout out to Sarah Ann because she is one of the most encouraging listeners. Uh, I actually have a little clip um, from her coming up next. And she's just been, been so supportive over the years. But last year, she did something for me that I will just never forget. And all the way from Australia, she sent me a care package of Australian things, including a recipe book that she made for me of different Australian recipes. And uh, actually, a month or two ago, um, all my dates are running together, but I guess it was about a month ago. We had some friends over for dinner who are Australian and I showed them the recipe book and they were like, oh my gosh, yes. Like we, I, I can't do an Australian accent, so I won't try. But she, they were like, yes, we, we ate all of these things. And so, um, there's a lot of really incredible recipes in that recipe book of, you know, kind of Australian, uh, authentically Australian food. But the one that I'm going to pick is uh, this probably the simplest of all the recipes, but it's because my kids love it the most. And that is fairy bread. And it's a um, it's like basically like buttered toast with sprinkles on it, essentially. But uh, and their sprinkles are called hundreds and thousands. And my kids love it so much. And apparently it's really common at Australian like kids birthday parties. And so that's just the most memorable for me. And I realized that that's like, <laughs> it's this most simple, but it's because my kids love it the most. And so uh, that would definitely be my answer for that. Okay, I've got more questions that you have submitted, but we are going to transition a little bit. And uh, I also have a couple of submitted, uh, listener submitted messages that just really encouraged me that I wanted to include throughout the show. And so uh, coming up is a, a little message from Sarah Ann. Hi friends, my name is Sarah Ann. I'm listening from regional Australia. I found Molly through the Cladwell app back when you could follow other people's wardrobes. I love this podcast because of the gospel lens that Molly brings to the ethical fashion space. It is unique as Molly shares so much of herself with us, which brings me a lot of joy. Thank you, Molly, for letting us into your family life and being the big sister that I never had. I want to take a moment to thank our partner of the show. And this is, you know, as big of a part of episode 300 as any of the rest of this, because without uh, my partners of the show, I couldn't do what I do. And so uh, today's partner is Mama Suds. If you have been listening to the show for any amount of time, you know how much I love Mama Suds. I've been personally using their product for years. I've had the founder, Michelle Smith, on the show. I am such a massive fan of this company. And so it is an honor to partner with them. So as you are doing your cleaning this summer, grab your Mama Suds germ cleaners and get to work. They clean everything from the windows to the walls to floors, upholstery, carpets, toilets, you name it. Mama Suds has a truly safe product to help you clean it. But most of all, their products are effective. They work. I'm telling you, we personally in, in our home use their Castile soap, their laundry soap. I just got their stain stick, which I had been searching high and low for a clean and effective stain stick. I also love their all-purpose household cleaner. We love them. We use them personally. And again, they are safe and they work. She's got some new products coming out this summer. So head on over to mamasuds.com. Place your first order. Use the code MOLLY for 15% off. Or you can sign up for their email list and find out when new products are coming. They've got recipes on their blog. I'm just such a huge fan. So go to mamasuds.com. Use the code MOLLY for 15% off your order. Now on to my conversation with my husband, John. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the show, to episode 300, the lovely and talented John Edwin Stillman. Welcome. Do I have the record for most appearances on this year podcast? It would either be you or Emily Gray. It's mm, possibly... That's a good point. It's possible she would have you... Even eat. if I have more appearances, she has definitely spoken more words. 
on this podcast. You are a man of a few words. Well, um, I was mainly suggesting she is a lady of many words. Yeah, but, she, but that's why I love her. That's why I love her. Um, before we were recording this segment, I was like, can you turn my headphones up? And then I immediately felt like, is it Jay-Z or, or basically any rapper from the 90s and early 2000s who at the beginning of their songs would ask the producer to turn their headphones up? And I was always very confused as to like why this was a trend to ask in the official recording for the producer to turn your headphones up. Yeah, I don't understand the reference. <laughs> so for the, you know, maybe quarter of you that understand the reference. Clint um, Black never asked for his headphones to be turned up in any <laughs> songs that I ever heard in the You 90s. are correct. George Strait never. Yeah. Headphones were always just fine for <laughs> King George. <laughs> um, here's one more question on, that is a pop culture reference that I know that you will not get, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because I saw a reel today of uh actually it was the coaching staff of the florida gator football team um that somebody was going around and asking all of the coaches to see if they knew the answer to this question and every single one of them did and it was just absolutely brilliant so it is seven o'clock on the dot do you know where usher is again i don't understand the, <laughs> the answer is in my drop top cruising the streets um anyway it was <laughs> now uh, I don't know whose song this was, but uh, if you had asked me, it's five o'clock in the morning, where are you going to be? I would have said outside on the Kona. I don't know who that is. No, I don't. Yeah, I don't know who that is either, but um, I'll look it up. Yeah. OK, you, you look this up. You, you fill time. I'll research. <laughs> OK, so uh, my most requested guest on this show is you, my husband. And so I figured it would be very fitting for episode 300. The, your first appearance on the show was episode 100. And I believe you made an appearance in episode 200. You also came on when we did a QA and a about the farm. And so, you know, you know, here we are, episode 300. So it's, it's only fitting that you're here. And... Nonchalant? Are you familiar with nonchalant? Nonchalant. I mean, I... Yes, but I actually don't know that I know that song. All right. Well, I'm more steeped in this stuff than you, you are. You are. You are way um, more steeped. Anyway, so but culture it, in general. If anybody I'm... is ever asking you, it's seven o'clock on the dot. Where is Usher? The answer is in my drop top. But uh, this is not knowledge that is ever going to help me anywhere. Ever. No, it's not. But it will earn you cool points. Yeah. So um, I will actually I, I'll see if I can find a link to the reel and have it linked in the show notes because it was really funny. It was like they it, they asked every single coach for the Florida Gators football team, including some that you would not think would get this, get it right. And they would go in my drop top. He's in his drop top. He's in his drop top. So anyway. I don't really know what a drop top. I guess it's a convertible of Correct. sorts. Okay. Um, when I owned a Jeep that had a, a top, a drop top, I never referred to it as a drop top. So I, I don't know if you would call a Jeep roof a drop top. <laughs> Perhaps. It's more like a, it takes 20 minutes to take the top off. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's not is, dropping so much as a uh, labor removal top. <laughs> yeah. This could easily go another direction. So we're going to veer it back on. All right. So we have some questions that the listeners submitted um, to for the two of us to answer. And so I'm actually going to have. Oh, you, I'm not asking you the questions. Well, you are. I'm also answering the questions. Yeah, we're both answering. I them. wasn't told that I needed to have any knowledge with which I need to answer questions. These are questions that you should just know the answer to. Well, don't get your hopes up. But okay. All right. All right. So question number one, uh, Christy asked, uh, John, this one's for you. What do you love most about Molly's job or what she does for a living? Um, are you going to tell the jury duty story? <laughs> you should tell the jury duty. I story. should tell the jury duty story to so, set up, to set up the answer. The actual so answer. I was, this was, I don't know, a month ago I got called for jury duty. Did not want to be there. Obviously, as I think most people don't. Unless it was um, the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case. <laughs> definitely don't want to be there for that. <laughs> um, so they said up front, this case is probably going to take three days. Some guy had tried to attack his girlfriend with a broomstick. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's a jury pool of like 50 people and they pick 12. And then they're going to vet those 12 people. Well, I end up in the initial 12, right? 
Um, and so they're asking all these questions, you know, trying to get a feel for who you know, like what kind of work you have. Is there anything going on in your life that's going to make you biased in this case? And she was asking different questions to everybody. So I wasn't necessarily prepared for the questions when it got to me. I was just trying to come up with something I could say inflammatory that would get me sent home. <laughs> um, but not knowing the questions, I didn't have any time to prepare. And so she asked about my family. I said, I got a wife, two kids. What's your wife do? And I just, I, I'm not a person who panics. You are not. Generally. You're very cool, calm, and collected. Uh, but in this moment, I panicked in trying to come up with a description of what it is you do <laughs> because I didn't want to say blogger. I didn't want to say podcaster. That didn't sound like a real job. So in my panic, I came out with something even worse. <laughs> and I said, she's a social media influencer. <laughs> and as it was spilling out of my mouth, I said, Oh, this is, I'm embarrassed that I'm saying this. And Molly would be humiliated that I'm saying this about her. Yeah. And in retrospect, I should have probably not even told you about it, but no. here we are. It makes for a great story. And so, yes, that is like literally the last thing I would ever describe myself as. However, but to answer the question is, what do you love most about what I do for a living? Uh, I guess the answer then is the fact that it's very hard to describe. <laughs> really? That's yeah, it? Sure. Interesting. Okay. I don't, I don't have to like your job. I only have to like my job. <laughs> Okay. Do you want me to go back to teaching? I could go back to teaching. Uh, we can pass on that. Okay. All right. I've seen the children of today. Oh, gosh. We'll okay. Keep you away from them. All right. Question number two. Cheryl Dunn asked, what is Wait, our... Her name is Cheryl Dunn. Not like... She done asked this question. No. Cheryl... Her name is Cheryl Dunn. Got it. All right. Cheryl Dunn. I'm sorry, Cheryl. Uh, Cheryl Dunn asked, what is our favorite part of homesteading? Uh, do you have a favorite part? My favorite part in general is just, I feel like the things that we have learned in a relatively short time, just about, you know, I don't want to, survival is not the answer, but just like how our food grows and how we, to care for animals and raise our own meat and the learning aspect of it all. I enjoy that uh, a lot. And I like seeing our kids get excited about different aspects of homesteading. They certainly have parts that they like more than others, but I would say, yeah, just the, the general education. Yeah. Like in general, I like knowing things that uh, most people don't know. And I very much tend to look down my nose at people who um, know things or don't know things that I know. Even when I just learned the thing, I then immediately look down on somebody who doesn't <laughs> know that thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I like knowing how to butcher chickens, which two years ago, I didn't know how to butcher a chicken. I don't know. A year ago, I didn't know how to butcher a chicken. But now when somebody's like, you, you butcher them yourself? You know how to do that? I'm like, well, yeah. What kind of idiot do you think I am? <laughs> of course. Who doesn't know how to butcher a chicken? So, yeah, I like being able to lord that knowledge over people. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty on brand. Yep. Okay. Uh, Maria J asked, and this is for you. I know your husband is a financial advisor. By the way, side note, I would love for you guys to do a money episode, by the way, which we should, I don't think we've ever done anything like that. So very well. All right. Um, See you in a hundred episodes. Yeah, no, we'll do one before that. Um, so, but she asked, I feel really overwhelmed with where to start in getting my overall finances in order. Where do I begin? Something like financial peace, total money makeover, or should I just look somewhere else? Well, yeah, any of those resources are fine, but what really matters is are you going to do, are you going to follow through on what you learn? Are you just going to read a book and then say, oh, well, okay, that's a lot of good knowledge to have and never do anything with it. If you were looking for one thing that you could do to begin with, I would say the first most important, if you've done nothing to like organize your money and know what you're spending and know how much you're bringing in and all that stuff, the first thing you could do is just spend a couple of months just tracking your expenses. Mm -hmm. Just figure out over the course of the next 60 or 90 days, how much do I spend on groceries? How much do I spend on you know, just maintaining my household, mortgage, electricity, all that stuff. Um, how much do I spend on just random crap like Starbucks or Chick-fil-A or whatever? And if you start to see, oh, wow, I spend a lot more in that category than I would have thought. 
I'm not saying that you should limit yourself in those categories, at least not initially. I'm just saying know how much you spend in those categories. And once you figure that out, then you're an adult. You can make decisions. And if you see that you uh, give charitably to the tune of $75 a month and you spend $275 a month at Bojangles, maybe this is a cue that you should reorient some priorities in your life. Mm, that's a really good answer. I knew that you would have a good answer to that, con, you know, for that considering you are a financial advisor. And yes, I think that leads me to say that we will do a, an episode on money because I think that it's just a question or a topic that I don't think we've really ever talked about on the show. So we're going to do that. Um, okay. Kelly R said john not, not r kelly but not r kelly, kelly r. but not r but, but see okay but you know that reference yes <laughs> okay well, uh, well. Once, once you pee on somebody's <laughs> face you really rise up in the stratosphere of people i have heard of oh gosh okay so r kelly r i almost said r kelly <laughs> kelly r i'm sorry kelly r uh do you have an interview that molly has done that sticks out to you as one of your personal favorites <sighs> Well, I mean, the Kev on stage interview was good just because it was funny. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the business owners that I would t say after I listened to it, I'm like, oh, that was really good. Now, like after the fact, they all kind of run together. Hmm. But if it sticks out, like what one that really sticks out to you is Kev on stage. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely one of the more memorable Well, just because like me. he was somebody that would have been in my uh, orbit. Bef not in my orbit. Maybe I was in his orbit. Yeah. He was somebody I was aware of yes. before you interviewed him. Yeah. And so for yeah. that reason, I knew him. And that was fun because then I interviewed him in August, right? Yeah. August of 2019. And then we went and saw him in person in February of 2020. And we got to, we had like meet and greet. And so I, that was fun getting to like, be like and it was february of 2020 so that was the last time we met or gret anyone <laughs> met or gret anyone yes. yeah um okay for a very long time uh bethany with two more questions for the two of us um bethany m says what is the best piece of marriage advice that someone has given you and what is the best piece of marriage advice you would give someone else yeah see i feel like people don't necessarily give great marriage advice Hmm. It's not that people give bad advice. It's just that when people say like, it's meaningless. Usually when you, if you ask somebody for marriage advice, like I, right before we got married, I was talking to a guy who'd been married like 60 years. And I, I remember this vividly. I was like, okay, well, what's the secret to be married 60 years? He's like, I don't know. I think you just have to find the right person. If it's not the right person, you're going to hate each other and you're going to get divorced. <laughs> Okay, well, hopefully I picked the right person. So. <laughs> Did you pick the right person? So far, so good. Okay, all right, good. Um, well, my answer to that would be, uh, and this is one of those pieces of marriage advice that s has stuck with me, it was in our premarital counseling, we met with the uh, amazing Fran and Mike Helpingstein. And I remember it was either Fran or Mike said, no marriage has ever failed where you have two people who are consciously spending every day trying to out-love the other person. Mm -hmm. And that just really stuck with me. And I would say that that's um, between that and just communication in general. Yep. If you're not communicating about things, then you're in trouble. Okay. Ha have sex a lot. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't hurt. Okay. Uh, Tara L, this is the last question for the two of us, is how is Molly different, mo the most different today than when you first married her? That's an interesting question. <sighs> well... I would say your the things that you care about, the things you're concerned about are, you know, 10, 12 years ago, you were much more concerned about things that I would say are more uh, like surface level, things that don't really matter kind of things. Not that you didn't have any substance to you at the time. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm just saying like the things that you concerned yourself with for the most part were not things of great significance, I would say. And, uh, you know, having a family obviously changes with that. Like you, you watch how people's, uh, political leanings often change when they're like young and single versus now, shall we say, approaching middle age with children, like, hey. like generally <laughs> people's, uh, ideology changes. So, so I can say, I've seen that in you. Interesting. Um, you've just become more family minded. I mean, think about yourself in your early 20s. Like, you were not what I would call a family-minded person. Yeah. Very career-oriented, focused on 
the showbiz aspect of life. Yeah. And that's not really your style now. Interesting. That's a not the answer I would have guessed, but I will uh I will I will take it. What would you have guessed? I'm not going to I'm not going to say. Mm, okay. I don't want to play I don't want to plant anything in your head that doesn't actually exist. Very well. Um okay, so I wanted to quickly with you go over the top 10 episodes. But before we do that, I just wanted to take a moment um, because this is like a unique thing and just honor a guest uh, that I had on who uh, sadly passed away. Um, And uh, his name was Eric Erdman. Uh, He was an incredible young man. He was on episode 191. I interviewed him at the end of April of 2020. He had cancer and he started a... Uh, an organization called Give a Child a Voice. Um, And I just remember what an incredible uh, young man he was. I mean, I think he was like 16 at the time that I interviewed him. And uh, sadly, he passed away in August of 2020 um, uh, from that cancer that he was battling. And so I just wanted to take a moment to honor him. And uh, I know, I mean, it was over, you know, almost two years ago that he passed, but um, I just thought that was important to mention. And if you have not listened to that episode, uh, definitely go back and just hear, you know, what an incredible man he was and the fact that he was using uh, his his one life and his, you know, sadly he passed at such a young age and he was using it to, uh, to give back um, in such a powerful way. So, um, but I thought I would just go over uh, the top 10 most popular episodes. And I did this in, I accounted for, time like because if I were to just I mean episodes that have been up there longer are going to naturally have more downloads so I looked at like the most popular in their first 90 days of airing okay. so that's that's my metric for this there's um, an easy way to sort that you can just show I can look at show me downloads first 90 days first 90 longer. days now obviously the, the ones that have aired in the past 90 days aren't necessarily mm-hmm. uh, counted in that but I just thought I would throw that out there. So uh, number 10 is actually our solo episode, episode 100. Still one of the most popular. Couldn't tell you what we talked about on that. A lot of things. I should go back and listen to it just mm. for funsies. Uh, number nine is your guy, Kev on stage. Okay. Very popular episode. People still listen to it. It's interesting to see because, I mean, he was on in summer of 2019 and he people are still listening to that episode. Can you see how much my bees are swarming out there? I can. That's a lot yeah, of bees. They're busy today. They are busy. They're Sorry, busy. They're busy on. bees. No, Number I liked eight, it. What you got? Um, so we're recording this in John's studio, which is in the barn, and his bees are right outside the window. And he's he really loves his bees. And this is a complete digression, but I don't care. We're going to go there because it's my show. <laughs> I've genuine anybody that knows me in person, like in real life, knows I am terrified of bees. Just absolutely terrified. I think they're really cool. I know that we need them does not change the fact that I'm terrified of them. But in the last few months, I've been like contemplating. I'm like, maybe, you know what? Maybe I need to get into bees. Like maybe I need to get into beekeeping. I'll get myself a bee suit and I'll go out there with you and Amos. And then what was it? Like two or three weeks ago, you you go out there and some bees got in your veil mm-hmm. and stung your head. It popped me in the head a few times. We were inside your veil and I was like, nope, nope, and I'm not. And you're out. And I'm out, and I'm out. Because I would have lost my ever loving mind if that happened to me so you wouldn't have handled it well i would not have handled it well you could just came in and you're like yeah got stung a few times in the face and i was just like okay well (laughs) and then there was one day where they like got down your pants or something or got up your pants uh yeah yeah not like all the way on my pants but (laughs) it was like you got stung in the leg a few times okay anyway all right back to uh the the top 10 list all right number eight uh christy wright Love me some Christy Wright. Mm -hmm. She was a good one. Number seven. uh, This is actually the first time she aired. This is a little bit of a clue because this person has been on twice and there's only three of those people. Number seven is Mary Morantz. Okay. Great one. Number six. My guy, Daniel Grothy. One of the best. He's been on twice. He's been on twice. Was that his first or second? This was his first one. Okay. Um, But his second one was up there as well. Um, So I kind of combined them together. Number five. Santiago Jimmy Mayado, yep. CEO of Compassion. Another good, one. another good one. Number four was uh, Jennifer Allwood. Love her. Big personality. Love her curls. Love everything she does. Um, but she's got just such an incredible story and business. And she was fun. 
Number three, Devin and Morgan Klein burn boot camp. Devin was number one for a very long time. Very long time. He was, he's always been top five, but yeah. uh, he's now at number three. Uh, number two, very similar to burn boot camp was uh, Kat Eccles, founder of Clean Juice. Yeah. She's been really high. And number one has overtaken everybody else and is like hundreds of downloads more than the next is uh rebecca smith from better life bags there you go yeah so that's our uh that's our top 10 episodes of the past 300 pretty incredible a lot of people a lot of people i can't believe and and to have only ever had three people on twice is yeah pretty remarkable and only like two of them are in jail now (laughs) so (laughs) well we won't go there (laughs) we won't go there (laughs) well there's nobody in jail yet (laughs) um so anyway everybody's like huh (laughs) We'll talk about it at another time. Give it time. time. Give it time. So I have for you here uh, some, I looked up shows that have aired more than 300 episodes. Okay. Obviously, these are all TV shows. I was not looking up podcasts that have aired more than 300 episodes, but just kind of see the stratosphere that you're in. All right. Uh, This is not an exhaustive list of every show with at least 300 episodes. Uh, but it's the 14 that I have heard of. Okay. Okay. I like it. Uh, coming in at 324 episodes, Criminal Minds. Ooh. Okay. I feel like there's 18 different shows of that ilk. Uh, some of them are on this list. Uh, ER, Ooh. 331 episodes. Did you ever watch ER? I think I saw an episode Ooh. probably. We should try to find somewhere to watch ER and go back and watch it. It's a good one. Uh, CSI, the mm. act, original mm. CSI, 337 episodes. Uh, Dallas, 357 episodes. Never seen a single episode of Dallas. Uh, I think a single, I don't know that I've seen a, like I know of Dallas, like I understand Dallas references. I don't yeah. know that I've actually really watched Interesting. it. Interesting. Um, Family Guy, 389 and counting. Uh, Grey's Anatomy, 398 and counting. Bonanza. Bonanza. Bonanza had 431 episodes. Bonanza. How about that? What a bonanza. What a bonanza. Uh, NCIS, again, back in the CSI Criminal Minds world, uh, 435 Ozzy and Harriet, also 435 I'm embarrassed to say I've never heard of that show. Uh, Little trivia for you. So Ozzy and Harriet were well they, I think they were the first TV married couple to share a bed on TV. Oh. So like Ricky and Lucy slept in separate twin beds. Mm. Ozzy and Harriet were the first married couple to be shown with a double bed. That is very that's a very fascinating thing. I would love to unpack the whole like Ricky and Lucy twin bed thing, nope. but we'll do it on another episode. Uh very scandalous to share a bed on TV like that. <laughs> uh Law and Order, the original Law and Order, four hundred and fifty six episodes. Law and Order SVU, five sixteen and counting. Hmm. A lot of episodes of SVU. Lassie had five hundred and ninety one episodes. I would never have said that Lassie had that Me many. Me neither. Uh Gunsmoke. 635 My episodes. dad loves some gun smoke. And uh, 728 and counting. The Simpsons. Would be The Simpsons. Yeah. Uh, of these 14 shows, would you like to guess how many of them I have seen a single episode of? Even just one episode. Mm, uh, let's go nine. More like six. Six, really? Interesting. Yeah. And uh, the only one that I've watched with any sort of regularity would be SVU. Yeah. I had an era where I watched a lot of We SVU. had an era together where we watched a lot of SVU. And mm-hmm. then at the end, we would always go, Dick Wolf. Dick Wolf. Dick Wolf. Yep. That's actually a Bryson thing. So anyway, for those of you who are like, who's Bryson? Bryson was John's roommate when John and I started dating. So and Bryson, he still hangs around. He's, he's our like assistant farmhand yeah yeah anyway well thank you for coming I, on i might be his assistant farm that's true that's honest. true let's be let's really be honest anyway well thanks for coming on i love you love you appreciate you see you later holly it's hard to say what my favorite episode is because i've listened to quite a few of them ever since i met you in i guess it was Summit for Seiko Fellows in 2019. First, I love that you make it so easy for us to find ethical fashion companies. Like, you've already done the work, you've already vetted the companies, and you have your mega list of awesome places that we can go. And it's not hard to shop ethically. Um, 
you literally just need to do one Google search. And it used to feel so overwhelming when I was first learning. And then I found you and realized it's not that hard after all. But also, I have really, really enjoyed, especially since I've gone back to listen to some of your earlier episodes, just being here to watch your dreams unfold because you used to talk about how you wanted to live on a farm and do the farm life. And then whenever I heard you were getting your farm, I admit I cried a little bit, but I'm just so happy for you. You're doing the thing. I'm here for the ride and I adore you. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Friends, thank you so much for celebrating with me. I am just overwhelmed right now thinking about this episode and just what it means. And the fact that so many of you week in and week out tune in to this show and share it on social media and support me and encourage me. I just, I couldn't do it without you. And my goal each and every week is to just serve you with this show and to encourage you and to have it be something that you look forward to. So as always, you can always reach out to me on social media. I'm at still being Molly or at business with purpose podcast on Instagram and Facebook, you know, shoot me a DM. Let me know if there's a guest you want to hear. Give me suggestions. Let me know how I can serve you better with this show. I would love to know your favorite episode. So, you know, share it on social media. You know, you can listen and you can tag it. You can post a screenshot, take a picture of you listening. It just encourages me each and every time. And don't forget, you can always use that hashtag business with purpose podcast. And as a little request from me, uh, just a, maybe a gift a gift <laughs> as a thank you um, or something, of, you know, for this episode, I would just love if you would head on over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, podcasts, radio public, wherever you listen and click the subscribe or follow button and leave a rating or review. That just helps me to know what you're liking, how the show is impacting you. It means more to me than you can possibly know. And it's totally free for you to do. As always, this show is produced by Third Wheel Media, and I'm so grateful to the team over there. Thank you, listener. You have no idea how much it means for you to support and listen week in and week out. Be sure to tune in next week. My guest is Bobby Grunewald, and he is the founder of the YouVersion Bible app. This was such a cool conversation, a really great opportunity to sit down and talk with the man who started the app that I use every single day. You would never guess as to where he got the idea for it. It's a really, a really cool story. So be sure to tune in next week. Don't miss that conversation. Now, thank you so much for listening and go do something good with purpose on purpose. See you next week. <laughs>